Do you know what the Bible says about what God did with your sin? More than merely knowing it, do you feel it deep down inside? The Bible uses many different words, images, and metaphors to talk about how God deals with our sin as redeemed children. And yet, so often, we can feel plagued with guilt and shame, struggling to really believe the core truth of the gospel. In Christ, we are truly forgiven. In my interview today, I'm talking with Sam Storms about how God deals with our sin once and for all. Sam serves as senior pastor of Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and is the author of numerous books, including A Dozen Things God Did With Your Sin and Three Things He'll Never Do from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Sam, thank you so much for joining me again on the Crossway Podcast. I'm glad to be back. Been looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so when it comes to the, the biggest problem that we as humans face, that would be our own sinfulness in the face of a holy God, uh, those of us who know God and love his grace, have been Christians for a long time, um, we, I think we know generally that we can't take care of this problem on our own. We get what the Bible teaches about our own inability to take care of our sin. And scripture makes that very clear to us. Uh, and yet I, I, I think that even for those of us who with our whole hearts believe that we need God's grace, we need his salvation, uh, we can nevertheless maybe still sometimes think a little bit simplistically about what it is that God has done for us, how he deals with our sin. Uh, I wonder, as you reflect on all the years you've spent teaching, preaching, shepherding um, people as a pastor and as a professor, uh, have you noticed that maybe sometimes even solid Christians can uh, not fully appreciate the the nuances and the beauty to what God has done for us? Absolutely. Uh, I, th- I think one thing I've noticed about Christians, and maybe this is true of human nature in general, is that we're hardwired for self-punishment. Mm. Um, there is this instinctive... Um, a reaction in our hearts and our souls when we fail, when we sin, when we don't live up to whatever standard we have embraced for ourselves. For Christians, it's the biblical uh, principles of right and wrong and of what would please God. <clears throat> and we, our instinctive reaction is to basically uh, fall into the pit of self-contempt, condemnation, um, despair, thinking that, oh, well, <clears throat> yeah, God... Uh, God forgave me when I first became a Christian, but I've probably pushed him over the edge. I've, mm. ca- I've, I, I've uh, uh, out-sinned his grace. I've gone beyond the capacity that even a good and holy God has to put up with somebody like me. And so we just fail to grasp the, the magnitude of the extent to which God went in the death of Christ uh, to deal with our sin. And I think that's the, the, one of the central problems. It may well be the single central problem mm. that Christians face in struggle in their Christian life is this, this idea that um, I've just out God's ability to have mercy and forgive me. Yeah. I, and they don't, they, so they live in doubt. They, they question their salvation. They don't have the, the joy of assurance. Uh, and all of that... Uh, really due to, I think, one primary factor, and that is we have not wrestled with what Scripture says God has done with our sin. We focus on our having sinned and not so much on what God has done with our sin. And that is what I think leads to so much despair and depression and shame and Mm. false guilt. Um, So that is what I have been trying to address in this book as best I can. It's just largely seen this in the body of Christ over the years. Hmm. Um, and I, I just think it needed to be addressed. Yeah. So you say that a fundamental core of why this is happening is because we don't spend enough time, we or spend too much time focused on our own sin and less time focused on our Savior and what he has done with it. Uh, do you ever get the sense that that is somewise, sometimes um, encouraged by the way we talk about sin, though, and the way we talk about uh, within the church, uh, what it means to be saved. We, there's such an emphasis sometimes on, um, maybe to put it bluntly, feeling bad about our sin. We, we, need, we know we need to repent. We need to turn from our sin. And we need to feel a level of remorse over it. Do you think sometimes that teaching is a little bit out of whack and that contributes to this? 
I think it can be. It, it honestly, it differs from church to church and from Christian to Christian. Hmm. Uh, there's no one size fits all when it comes to this. But I do think that um, the, the the central problem uh, is just the failure to grasp the significance of what is known as penal substitutionary atonement, which I address uh, rather directly and extensively in the book, uh, primarily because uh, not only do good Bible-believing Christians don't know what it means, but because there's so much pushback on the part of progressives who think that it's a a horrific way of envisioning the relationship between Mm. the Father and the Son. Unpack that a little bit for us, because I think now maybe first define what penal substitutionary atonement is for those who aren't familiar with that term which does sound, it sounds a little bit kind of harsh or cold or yeah. scary. <laughs> and then why is it that there are some Christians uh, or some uh, people who claim to be Christians who would, uh, yeah, raise a lot of concerns with that doctrine? Yeah. Yeah, I actually talk about the glory of penal substitution mm-hmm. in the book because it is a glorious, glorious truth, um, apart from which Christianity makes no sense whatsoever. I don't think, this is my own conviction, I don't think you can preach the gospel apart from penal substitution. I don't think there is a gospel. There is not. What good news do I have to bring to a lost and dying world who stand in in jeopardy of eternal damnation if I don't have the solution that God has provided in the cross of Christ? The simple fact of the matter is God is infinitely holy and infinitely just, and his own nature requires him to, um, to punish violations of his will. It's not because God is a bully. It's not because he's mean. It's because he's good and just and holy and true to his own character. And what we have in the death of Christ is Jesus in our stead as our substitute. There's the substitutionary uh, element. Enduring the penalty, there's the penal element, the, the just deserts of our sin and satisfying the demands of God's holy justice and wrath so that we can be set free. If I don't have that message, if I can't go to a non-Christian world, an unbelieving world, and say, look, the greatest threat to your welfare, both now and eternity, and in eternity, is the wrath of God. If I don't have a solution to that, if I don't have an answer to that, what good news do I have to proclaim? Mm. Um, Now, those who push back on penal substitution say it's barbaric, it's it's the father abusing the son. Uh, it disrupts the, the, the harmony and the unity of the Trinity. All of the, I answer all of those objections in the book. Um, but the bottom line is they say, well, you know, God is merciful. He can just kind of let bygones be bygones. Well, that, that reveals a horribly deficient view mm. of God, that God somehow in his justice and his holiness and his love for goodness and his hatred of evil can just somehow push delete and suddenly all of the transgressions of our lives, all of the vile rebellion against uh, the revelation of God in nature and in creation and in Scripture is somehow just willy-nilly cast aside and swept under the the carpet of God's mercy is demeaning to God. Mm. So I think penal substitution is a glorious, wonderful uh, expression of how much God loves us that he and the son would, as it were, enter into a covenant by which they would deal with the, the judgment that we so richly deserve. Mm. So what would they des- describe as the purpose then of Jesus' death if it wasn't to uh, bear the wrath of God on they our They can't. Behalf? Bottom line is they cannot. Um, they, they, would, they would say things such as, well, it was to show us how Jesus identified with the poor and the outcast. Mm. Or it was designed to uh, show us what real love is for others. And I say, well, you know, if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm walking alongside a, a friend um, along the lake shore and I fall in, um, what is love? H- how does he demonstrate love for me? It's by jumping in and at risk to his own life, securing my safety and pulling me from the waters while he drowns. Um, just to stand on the shore and say, hey, I just want you to know how much I love you as you die. Mm. That's not love. Or just to jump in and die himself. Exactly. It's not. If it doesn't secure my safety and my freedom and release. Mm. So honestly, that's a great question. Why did Jesus have to die? They might say, well, maybe he didn't have to, but he chose to. But if he didn't have to die, why would the father, according to Romans 8, not spare his own son, but deliver him up for us all? Mm. So they'd have no way to rationally, biblically explain 
the reality of Christ's death. Again, it's, oh, it's to set an example, or it's to uh, break the power of Satan, or it's to restore the image of God in man, which, all of which, of course, Jesus did. All of these, you know, these theories or explanations or models of the atonement are true, but they're only true because of the underlying foundational reality that in his dying in our place, he satisfied the wrath of God and endured the penalty that we deserve so that we now don't have to suffer it. That is out of which flows all of these other effects of his atoning death. That's why he was able to defeat Satan. Mm. What, what's Satan's uh, grip on us? Unforgiven sin. Um, how, you know, how has the image of God been damaged? It's been damaged by sin. We're restored only because Christ has uh, endured in our place and reconciled us to the Father and dealt with the issue of our uh, our cosmic treason against an infinitely holy God. Mm. Well, that's a good uh, is a good moment to take a big step back. Then, and I want to talk about sin. Mm-hmm. This idea of sin. I know it's a, it's a very basic concept that probably all the believers listening right now would think. I know what that is. I know how to define that. But I think it's worth taking that step back and actually trying to uh, understand some of those terms a little bit more comprehensively. So I have three questions. I was wondering if you could answer. First, what is sin? How would you simply define that? What makes it bad? Uh, why is it something that, that we would theoretically mm-hmm. want to avoid? And, and why is it a problem for us as humans? Yeah. Well, the most basic definition is it's any lack of obedience to, either by commission or omission, the revealed will of God. It's a, it's a willful violation of the will and, and the character and, and the moral law of God as revealed in Scripture. Uh, it's both in terms of what we do and what we don't do. It's, um, it's defiance. Uh, I love the way R.C. Sproul used to define it. He called it cosmic treason against the God of the universe. Um, so th- that is the most fundamental definition of what it is. And again, it's interesting when you, when you deal with Christians who are really struggling in this area, um, they don't so much wrestle with what is sin. What they wrestle with is what I call a defiled conscience. They find themselves um, convinced that they are beyond the reach of God's love. They find their hearts are deeply burdened, which obviously is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. It's the, it's the function of our human conscience. But they find themselves convinced that there's no hope that they can be of any value to the kingdom that they are basically, uh, you know, a wart on the face of the body of Christ, mm. that they're disqualified from ministry, um, that God is deep down inside really irked with them. And he basically just tolerates them rather than enjoys them and sings over them as his children. So that's the reality of what sin does. That, that's the effect it has on the human heart. Uh, again, I, I don't think the issue for Christians is that they're sitting there wondering, um, have I lost my salvation? H- have I finally pushed God beyond his limits? What they're wrestling with is this feeling of being dirty inside. Mm. They don't have the joy of being forgiven and cleansed and justified. They don't experience what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 8, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Um, they just are living convinced uh, that they're under this dark cloud of God's disdain, even though they may be his child. Uh, he, he doesn't. He just puts up with me. He yeah. tolerates me. He doesn't delight in me, and that just paralyzes Christians. I, I'm kind of answering all your questions at once. Really, the last one: why? Why does it matter? Why should we care? It's because it cripples and paralyzes the human heart mm. from entering into the joy and the peace and the freedom of knowing what it is to be a redeemed, adopted, forgiven child of God. Mm. And I want to explore some of those. How do you respond pastorally to some of those people who are feeling those things? Uh, I want to come back to that at the end, but I think one of the main points you're making in your book is that that the core of the answer to how we actually move past those feelings and embrace the joy of our salvation fully is through meditating a little bit more uh, more intentionally on what the Bible does exactly. tell us about how God deals with our sin. And I think as I was looking through your book, and just as I've read through Scripture over the years— it is amazing when you start to pay attention the the variety of ways that the Bible describes how God deals with our sin. 
there's many different metaphors, there's many different pictures that God uses in the Bible to, to try to convince us, it seems, that he really has taken care of our sin. I wanted to, to pick a couple of them out just to kind of dig into a little bit more. And, and maybe the most foundational basic idea is that of forgiveness. We've already referenced that mm-hmm. before. And we all, we all have a sense of what that means. Um, it's a seemingly simple word that we even, a concept that we employ in our own relationships with other, other Christians, other people in our lives. But I, I do wonder if sometimes we, we don't fully understand what Scripture is actually telling us when it uses that word forgiveness. So how would you define God's forgiveness in light of the Bible? I use in the book a silly illustration <laughs> from my childhood. I and somebody told me this thing is still available. The etch a sketch, you know, the little oh, TV yeah. screen with the two little two knobs. knobs, and you can sketch whatever you want onto. And the good thing about it is, since I'm not very artistic, is when I look at what I've done and it's ugly, it's it makes no <laughs> sense. All you have to do is tip the screen. Suddenly, it goes blank. It's cleansed. It, it's gone forever. There's no remnant of what you have. Uh, horribly tried to portray on that screen <laughs> in a in a kind of a strange sort of way this is what forgiveness is is that there is a record a screen on which is inscribed every transgression we've ever committed past present and future all of the willful violations of God's law all of the sins of omission the things we failed to do it should have done and it has portrayed a very horrible ugly repulsive picture on the screen of our souls And because of what God has done in Christ, taking our guilt, laying it upon his son, him enduring the punishment we should have suffered, God, as it were, tips the screen of our souls Mm. and it all disappears. Forgiveness means there's no record in the heart and mind of God of our transgressions that he will use against us, that he will throw back in our face, that he will, you know, someday say, well... I've actually, I've actually been recording all your transgressions after all, and here's a list of them for which you must now suffer. Forgiveness is wiping clean the slate of our souls. It's the cleansing element. It's the release from any penal consequence of our transgressions. Now, having said that, people, I don't want people to be mis- misled. I'm not saying that our sin doesn't affect our relationship with God hmm. because I make a very important distinction in the book between what I call the eternal union we have with Christ and our experiential communion. In terms of our eternal union, our standing with God, our justification, all those sins, past, present, and future have been forgiven. They have been wiped clean. Mm. They will never factor into that relationship with God as if it could somehow threaten us with eternal damnation. But our experiential communion, our daily uh, capacity to enjoy God's forgiveness, to walk in intimacy with the Lord can be damaged by sin. That's why we need to repent. We need to confess. We need to con- keep you know, short accounts with the Lord. Uh, so when Christians understand that distinction, They'll understand why I can say that on one hand, sin will never factor into our relationship with God in terms of our eternal salvation, but it has a major impact in terms of our experiential daily capacity to feel God's affection. Hmm. When we're living in unrepentant sin, it's hard to feel the delight that God has in us. Um, it, It cuts off communication. It clouds our minds. It our hearts are, are not being, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, enlightened to understand the hope that we have in Christ. So uh, sin has that, that effect on our experiential communion, but not on our eternal union with God. And that seems like a really crucial distinction that maybe sometimes we don't, we don't make. We, we conflate our experience of our relationship with God, that communion side, with the eternal union that we do have that is secured uh, in Christ before the foundation of the world, even. Mm-hmm. Um, is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think what this does is there are, there are two camps in the professing Christian world that are at the opposite end of the spectrum on this issue. There are some who say, um, you, you, you do not have forgiveness for sins that you have not yet committed, only for past sins and present ones that you've confessed. But the future sins, well, they're still a threat to your life. And then there are others who say, no, no, because you have complete forgiveness for past, present, and future sins, you never have to confess, you never have to repent because it's all been dealt with once and for all. And they're both wrong. Hmm. It has all been dealt with once and for all in terms of establishing that eternal union. We are in Christ. 
Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And he lists all the potential threats. But on the other hand, we need to understand that, yes, there are sins that we will commit in the days ahead or, if, or even today that can disrupt and, and, and uh, somehow um, hinder our capacity to walk in joy and peace and delight and a sense of freedom and a, and a feeling of God's love on, on a daily experiential basis. So I think both of those extremes are wrong, and I think if we could just understand this distinction between eternal union and experiential mm. communion, something that is eternally true, always has been, always will be, as over against the fluctuations on a daily basis in our capacity to delight in God and feel mm. His delight in us. Yeah, and it strikes me too that having a robust confidence in that eternal union is the fuel that we need to exactly. then pursue the communion, the, the healthy communion with God. Precisely. It's, it's knowing that there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ that impels and drives me to the pursuit of practical holiness. Contrary to what some say, you know, that Paul was even accused of. Mm, oh, yeah. let us sin all the more that grace may abound. No, Paul says, God forbid. Yeah. If, if you truly understand as a born-again child of God, the reality of the extent to which Christ went to deal with the, the biggest problem, the greatest threat to your soul, namely the wrath of God, that energizes the human heart. How could I not seek to obey a God who would love me to that extent? Um, and so, yeah, this idea that somehow our, the reality of our eternal union will release us to uh, live a life of licentiousness and idolatry because we don't have to worry about its effect on our relationship with <laughs> God horrible, horrible distortion of what the Scripture is teaching. Mm, yeah. I want to return back to that Etch-A-Sketch uh, metaphor that you, you used a few minutes ago. And I think it's powerful because we know that with an Etch-A-Sketch, once you shake that thing, once you turn it upside down, uh, it's gone. There's no undo button. Uh, unlike a, maybe a computer today where anything you do sort of with a, uh, some quick shortcut, you can bring back what you accidentally deleted. Uh, but I wonder if um, people might be thinking, does that metaphor work with God? And it kind of actually fits in with another one of the things you draw out in the book about uh, God and how he relates to our sin. Uh, Isaiah 43, 25 is a famous passage. I'm going to read it here. Uh, God says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there, there's a question in my mind, at least, and, and maybe other Christians' minds, that uh, how does that work with God? How could God not have an undo button? He, he does. He, could, could he truly forget something in the sense that uh, we can kind of erase and completely remove like we could with an Etch-A-Sketch? So how do we understand that verse? What is he trying to say there? And does God truly forget our sins? Great question. I am happy to answer it. I also just want to squeeze in on the front end of my answer that the book addresses 12 different ways in which God has dealt with our sin. I mean, he removes it as far as the east is from the west. He casts it in the depths of the sea. He tramples it underfoot. He turns his face away from it. All of these incredibly beautiful metaphors and analogies and, mm -hmm. and um, illustrations, that's what constitutes the bulk of the book. And the one that you brought up is probably one of my favorites. And it's important to remember a distinction between forgetting and choosing not to remember. Mm. You and I cannot choose to forget. If we try to forget something, guess what? It's going to be right in the forefront <laughs> of our thinking. It races back into our minds. So no, God cannot forget anything. God is omniscient. He knows everything exhaustively in minute detail. That's what it means to say God is all-knowing. But when God says, I will not remember, I think what he's saying is, I will never bring up your sin to you and use it against you. I will never throw it back in your face. Think about how different this, this is for us. Somebody violates me or betrays my confidence, and my tendency is to say, I will never let you forget this. Mm. I'm going to bring it up at every opportunity. Yeah. I'm going to use it against you. I'm going to hold it over your head. And when it's, God says, I will not remember their sins anymore. He's saying, I will never do that. I won't bring it up. It's not that, it's not that I've pushed delete in my infinite mind mm, and somehow yeah. I can't remember your years of unbelief and rejection of Christ or your sexual immorality before you were born again. No, God says, 
I simply will never bring that up. I will never use it against you. I will never throw it back in your face. Mm. It will never become a factor in how you and I relate one to another. That's the glory of of God promising not to remember. Mm. Um, so again, the idea that God forgets, no, but in a sense, yes, because he says, I won't remember it. Yeah. And so as far as we're concerned, that's basically what we mean by saying God yeah. forgets it. It's it's almost a, a more beautiful um, statement than when you realize it and understand it that way. There's a, there's a decision that God is making not to hold this against us. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he is, that's how much he loves us, that he would would choose never to bring it up again. Yeah, and I, th- I think one of, the, one of the great glorious things about life in the new heaven and new earth after Christ returns is that we will remember our sins, but not in a way that will diminish our joy. We will remember them for the sake of delighting in the reality of forgiveness mm. and think, my goodness, look at what God has done for me. Let me worship him all the more, all the more passionately and sincerely. So... Um, m- I strongly suspect that we will see in eternity future um, how God orchestrated our lives for our good in spite of our sin, mm. and how he made use of our transgressions to bring honor to his own name, but not for the purpose of bringing sadness to our souls, but incredible delight and joy and exhilaration in knowing that those failures, those sins will never threaten our relationship with the Lord mm. forever and ever. This is, this is a bit of an aside. This is an interesting example of a passage where um, we need to read Scripture in the light of all of Scripture. Mm-hmm. And we know from the rest of Scripture that God is omniscient. He does know all things. And so we, we need to read this passage where it says that uh, he won't remember our sin mm-hmm. kind of in the light of the broader knowledge that we have of who he is. Yeah, and the good thing about this, this same metaphor that I address in the book is that there are a lot of things that God says, I will remember. Mm. Memory says, I will remember my people. I will remember my covenant. I will remember my promises. But and so that doesn't just mean that he's going to remember it like we would. It, it means more than that. It means he's going to act upon it. Exactly. Exactly. He has made a promise to us that is sealed with the blood of Christ mm. that he will never break. And that is, I will never again make reference to, mention, hold over your head, say to others, or in any way uh, exploit your failures uh, as a way of justifying my disdain for you or my rejection of you. Mm, wow. Praise God for that. Yeah. As another idea that we encounter repeatedly in the Bible throughout both the Old and New Testaments is the idea of being cleansed from our mm-hmm. sins, that metaphor of cleaning or washing. Um, I wonder if you could flesh that out for us, especially as it relates to the way that one, one of the most common uh, ways that we respond to our own sin or feel about our sin is a, a sense of defilement or dirtiness mm-hmm. or shame because of our sin. Um, unpack that idea of cleansing in the sure. Bible. Well, let's be clear about one thing. Um, we're supposed to feel conviction. That's what the conscience is in the human soul. It's that that capacity of the image of God in, in humans that registers either... Um, a discomfort and a pain for having failed or a sense of joy for having succeeded. And we are supposed to, there's a sense in which I want to feel, um, in a sense, the defiling effect of my sin, but not so that it cripples my life or leads me to doubt whether God really cares for me or has actually done enough to secure the salvation of my soul. The problem, though, with this whole idea is that Christians live in a constant state of defilement, of feeling dirty, of feeling disqualified, um, of feeling that um, I've just simply gone too far in my rebellion and my unbelief and my uh, failures. And this whole image of cleansing, uh, you know, David in Psalm 51, he talks about cleanse me from my sin and purify me with hyssop. Hmm. Uh, hyssop is this kind of funny looking little stalk. It looks like broccoli. They would dip, <laughs> they would dip the head of the hyssop in, in the blood that was shed and sprinkle it. So it's going back to, back to Passover. Right, right. Hmm. And <clears throat> the idea is, um, the imagery that I have, and I talk about this in the book, is I've got this one shirt and I've left it in my closet. It's a white shirt and there's this huge brown spot on the 
left side, right above the pocket. <laughs> and I took it to the cleaners multiple times. I pointed it out to them. I, you know, I said, use whatever you can to get that stain out of there. And they never could. And I'd come back with a little, little note on it that says, sorry, we couldn't remove it. I'd take it back. i say, try this. They'd try. And finally, I realized that sometimes is the way Christians feel about their sin. It's like I've got this deep, dark, dyed-in stain on mm. my soul, and nothing can remove it. Nothing. Uh, not, I can't do enough good works to make it go away. I can't trick myself into thinking it's not there. And the only way that that deep, dark stain on our souls can be um, removed is through the blood of Christ, which is, by the way, an interesting irony, is it not? Because mm. blood stains, and yet it's the blood that cleanses from all stain. Mm. Um, so to be able to wake up in the morning and not feel dirty in the presence of God is a glorious reality. And it only comes when we reflect and meditate on the things that God has done with our sin, one of which is he's blotted it out. He's cleansed it. Uh, it's just such a beautiful image that Scripture uses. Mm. What would you say to the person, the Christian listening right now, who, who says, I believe that. You know, I believe what you're saying about Christ's work on my behalf and how I am cleansed. I, I Intellectually, I get that. But I just struggle with my feelings. I do wake up every morning, and my mind just seemingly automatically goes to this thing in the past that I feel like defines me uh, and it it haunts me. Mm -hmm. uh, is that just something that they're going to have to struggle with for the rest of their life? I think all of us do to varying degrees. Um, and let's, let's remember, we have a diabolical enemy who, according to Ephesians 6, is, is raining down these fiery darts on us, constantly accusing us, constantly um, reminding us of our failures yesterday and how unqualified we are and how much of an embarrassment to Jesus we are. And I think the, the, the solution of, of, that the Scriptures give us is, first of all, we've got to pray. Cry out to the Spirit of God. Spirit of God, help me. Open my eyes to the truth of what I see in Scripture. Meditate on God's Word. Memorize it. So when those, those convicting, piercing pangs of conscience hit us, we can quote Scripture back to them. Mm. And we can declare that, um, you know, he who confesses his sin, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Um, so you have to fight the lie of the enemy with the truth of Scripture. You have to speak back to the enemy. And even if it's not Satan doing it, and I wanted to blame everything on the devil, although he deserves a lot of it, <laughs> uh, if it's just the, the, the weakness of our conscience. You see, here's the interesting thing. Um, I remember reading in uh, Packer, I think it was in Knowing God, he talked about how people have differing levels of sensitivity in their conscience. There are some people who have a very strong and robust conscience and they, they can quickly embrace the reality of God's love and forgiveness in Christ and they don't wallow in the, in the mud and the murk of, of uh, self-condemnation and contempt. And there are other Christians who have a hypersensitive conscience mm. and they are the ones who the slightest misstep in their life just suddenly they're living under this cloud of condemnation and rejection and contempt. And so it depends on kind of the nature of your own conscience and the level of your own maturity in Christ. But I think the solution for all of us is we have to take the truth of God's Word and speak it and believe it and trust it and cry out to the Spirit of God to open our eyes to the reality of what God has done with our sin in Christ that's the ultimate solution. There is, mm. there, there's no kind of button you can push in your soul and make all the, the feelings of guilt and condemnation go away. Mm. The, res, the answer is the truth of God's revealed word. God's saying to us, listen, to, listen, my child, listen to me. Here is what I've done with your sin. That, that issue in your life, maybe, it, maybe it's something happened 10 years ago and you've been living with the regret and the pain of that action all these years, and it's kept you from worshiping me passionately, it's kept you from coming to the throne of grace in prayer, listen to me. I cast it behind my back. I turned my face away from it. I put it in the depths of the sea. I've blotted it out. I've cleansed it. I have laid it on my son in your place. God says, listen to what I have done. Mm. And when we do that, 
the promise of God is that the Holy Spirit will make that a living, life-changing reality in our souls. Mm. So you're a pastor, you've taught as a professor, um, and yet have there been times in your life where you feel like you yourself have struggled to, uh, to believe these things about your own sin and how God's dealt with it? Daily. Mm. <laughs> I hate to say that. Mm. Daily. I... I uh, tend to be on the spectrum of conscience, as Packer would lay it out, on the kind of overly sensitive. Mm. Um, my parents, I, did, I don't remember this, but my parents said that when I was growing up, they had to be very careful to say no to me because once they did it, I would never do that thing again. Wow. And I would lock, not that I was an obedient some, child. Some parents are like, how did that work hey, out? Listen, I, 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 I was a messed up little sinner as much mm. as anybody else. But um, so, yeah, I live with that reality. It, and again, I think that's the nature of sinful, fallen humanity. So you you say that oversensitivity can actually be a, a function of our sinfulness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, there are times when, the, and again, here's the good news. And I know this sounds strange, even almost contradictory. We have this idea that the the more we grow up in Christ, the less painful our sin will be to our souls. And I think it's just the opposite. When we're first born again, we still sin a lot, but we don't feel the pain of it very much. As we grow up in Christ, we sin less, but we feel its pain more. Mm. And the reason is because maturity is becoming more like Jesus. It's growing closer and closer to the Son of God in, in relational intimacy. So even though now, by God's grace, I sin less than I did 20 years ago, when I do sin, it hurts more than it did 20 years ago mm. because I know Jesus better now. I want to please him more intensely now. And so I, when I say daily I feel that, I think that's a good sign. I think that's mm. an indication, hopefully by God's grace, that I'm actually growing up in Jesus and being more and more conformed to his image. Yeah. So as we are more conformed to the image of Christ, the sin we commit, even though it's fewer and far between, it's going to feel more painful. Mm. And I think that's a good sign. It's a good indication we're actually making progress in the Christian life. How does that fit then, though, with the idea that as we grow in Christ, our appreciation for the gospel, our trust in the gospel and what God has done for us to take care of our sin should be greater and stronger. So we should feel, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't we also, though, feel more consoled, more confident in his grace? Yes. It's, it's a both and. Mm. It's, it's, I, I not only am... I, don't, I not only feel a deeper, more intense anguish when I sin, but I also feel a greater joy and exhilaration and delight when I reflect on the fact that God has forgiven me of that sin. Mm, yeah. And he's wiped the slate clean, and he will not bring it up and throw it back in my face. So it's, it's a both and. Yeah. Both of those things have to function. And, and unfortunately, here's the problem, is that some Christians embrace one to the exclusion of the other. Some live under the lingering condemnation of a, of a sensitive conscience, not aware of what God has done for them in Christ, whereas others are so um, embracing of the reality of grace that they feel like it releases them to sin all the more and they don't have to worry about the consequences. Mm. And again, both of those extremes, either antinomianism or licentiousness are contrary, or excuse me, ant antinomianism or legalism, basically, and hyper grace are the two extremes that we need to avoid. Mm, yeah. So maybe there's a Christian listening right now who uh, has his or her theology kind of straight and buttoned down and would, would affirm with you the idea of uh, the, the perseverance of the saints, the idea that God, once we're saved, once we've trusted in, in Christ for salvation, God's forgiven our sins and, and we are, he will not lose us. Um, nothing will jeopardize that. We have that eternal union, mm -hmm. but they maybe look at their own lives, look at their sin, look at their continued struggle with sin, and they're not wondering, have I lost my salvation? They're just maybe wondering, was I ac actually ever saved to begin with? How could I actually be a Christian with the way that I'm sinning, the way that I'm struggling with this, this persistent thing that just I can't seem to get over? What would you say to that person? Well, in some cases, that's not a bad thing. You know, Paul says, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Um, you know, 2 Peter 1 talks about um, this, this same reality, making your calling and election sure. I don't, I don't want Christians to live in doubt. I think we're supposed to live in the confident assurance that we're in a saved and eternal relationship with the Lord. But if we're living in unrepentant sin, 
if we're if we're constantly with a high hand defying um, the God who we trust has saved us, then maybe sometimes a, a person needs to stop and st- and take stock of their souls and say, all right. Now I read First John that there are certain indications that I'm truly born again. Do, do I live in love toward my fellow brethren? Am I seeking to obey the will of God? Um, so I, I do think that some people uh, presume upon God's grace, and the fact of the matter is they aren't truly born again. And maybe this conviction and this doubt is the work of the Spirit of God in awakening them to the need for a Savior. Others are truly saved, and they just simply haven't been able to process and have registered deep down in their souls the reality of what forgiveness really means and cleansing from sin and justification. So it, it all depend, It all goes from, there's no one size fits all. Mm-hmm. Every Christian wrestles to differing degrees with this issue. So on the one hand, it's not always bad to kind of wonder, am I, am I really born again? Would I, would I have done and continue to do what I'm now doing if I were truly a child of God? And on the other hand, I want you to live in the confident joy of knowing that, that you really are hmm. uh, justified in the sight of God and the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you through faith in him. And so, yeah, there's a lot of room between those two extremes hmm. that we have to work with. And it all depends on each individual. You know, if, if I'm sitting with somebody as I have in the past, let's just take an issue that's so much in the forefront of the world today of pornography. And a man says, you know, I'm just, you know, I, 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 know I'm, I'm, I know I'm a Christian. I walked an aisle, raised a hand, signed a card 25 years ago. But um, I'm addicted to pornography, and I kind of enjoy it, and I don't want to break from it. I'm not going to give that guy assurance of salvation. I'm not going to say, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Um, you know, you, you signed a decision card. You, mm. you, you had an experience when you were nine years old. You're saved. I'm not going to do that. I may not have the authority to tell him he's not born again, but I'm certainly not going to give him the assurance that he is. Mm. So that's different from a man who's sitting there who is shattered in his soul with his sin. He is broken. He is weeping. He said, I want to be free. Help me. Pray for me. I know I'm, I know I'm violating and bringing grief to the Holy Spirit uh, by my repeated failure in this regard. What can I do to overcome this addiction? That's the kind of man I'm going to say, hey, the first thing you need to know is God really loves you. Mm -hmm. He's delighted in you as your child. I see the evidence of repentance and the fruit of the Spirit in your life in the way you've reacted to your sin. So, yeah, let's deal with this issue together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that just underscores, even in my mind, the value of if someone's struggling to to discern where are they at uh, on that front, uh, going to a pastor, going to another Christian that they trust Mm -hmm. and talking about that with them could be a really helpful eye-opening thing for those who maybe doubt their own ability to assess their their hearts. Yeah, I had a not long ago precious young lady in our church um, who has been married a couple of times and divorced, and she'd been sexually promiscuous in her past, and she was living with this constant cloud of doubt over her. her, her she just woke up and it's there, smothering her, suffocating her confidence in Christ, saying, "I just, I just." can't believe that God would love me. I can't believe that, that he's really saved me. Even though she had repented, she's walking in holiness, the, the, the dark stain of her past was almost more than she could bear. And that's the kind of person that I like to look at with a smile and say, listen, you have no idea how loudly God is singing over you in joy mm-hmm. and delight. He loves you. He sees the brokenness in your heart. He sees the desire for you to live in purity. And it just pleases him beyond words. That's the kind of individual who has come to understand, who needs to obviously to read my book <laughs> and say, all right, I need to have reinforced in my heart all the many things God has done with my sin. Yeah. By the way, isn't it interesting, we haven't talked about this, that God would repeatedly use so many different images and illustrations and language to, to reinforce this point. It's like God says, I know what you all are like. Mm, I know the struggle yeah. you're going to have. I know you need me to hammer this home over and over again in, in, a, in a variety of different ways to try and finally drive home to your soul uh, the truth of what I've done with your sin in Jesus. Mm. Um, and so I, often we can reduce them down. We can kind of read them as interchangeable. And they, are, they all are getting at the same fundamental reality, but they all have their own flavor to them. They have their own glories to them. 
that I think it's worth us slowing down and pondering a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a a final question, uh, in the the last chapter of your book, you write something that really hit me and might sound like it's at odds with what we've been talking about today even. Uh, You write, what ultimately makes the gospel good news isn't that we get forgiven, saved, delivered, healed, renewed, justified, and adopted, as good and glorious as these experiences are. So why would you say that? What are you getting at there? Uh, and um, yeah, how is that true? Well, I can blame my friend John Piper for that. <laughs> John's book, God is the Gospel, uh, he makes the point very clear. Yes, these are glorious blessings. I mean, who would not want them all? And as God's children, we have them all. Mm. Why do we have them? Why did God do that? He did it so that we could get him. In other words, stand in his presence. I think of that doxology in Jude with which I close the book where we stand with joy before the glory of God and get to behold his beauty, get to set our gaze and our thoughts and our eyes upon the majesty of who he is. How is that possible? And it's only possible because God forgave us and justified us and redeemed us and adopted us and cleansed us and all the things that he has done to make us fit for his presence, Mm. fit to experience the deep delight of knowing him and seeing him and enjoying him. So the goal of God in the work of Christ for us, as Peter says it, the just for the unjust, he died, the, the just for the unjust, that we might come to God, that we might get God, that we might, as Revelation Uh, tells us stand in his presence and behold his face that's the pinnacle of salvation the pinnacle of salvation isn't that my soul feels clean my soul feels clean because otherwise if it didn't i couldn't stand in the presence of the infinitely righteous Mm. god of the universe so all of these blessings of salvation are wonderful but they are secondary to the ultimate goal which is that we might stand in god's presence and enjoy him forever. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, Sam, thank you so much for taking some time today to walk us through some of, just some of what the Bible tells us about what God does with our sin. And you you cover many, many more things in your book. Uh, We appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. That was Sam Storms on how God deals with our sin through the work of Christ. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, A Dozen Things God Did With Your Sin, and three things he'll never do. Pick up your copy of the book for 30% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org plus. That's crossway.org plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.